Start of Chapter 3 The Battle of Uhud Allah did indeed fulfill His promise to you when you were about to annihilate the enemy with His permission until you flinched and fell to disputing about the command and disobeyed after He showed you what you covet. Among you were some that hankered after this world and among you were some that desired the hereafter. Then did He divert you from them in order to test you but He has forgiven you, for Allah is full of grace to those who have faith. Quran chapter 3 verse 152 Everybody in Mecca rejoiced at the arrival of the caravan from Palestine. The caravan had been in grave danger during the few days it moved along the coastal road near Medina and very nearly fell into the hands of the Muslims. It was only the skill and leadership of Abu Sufyan who led the caravan that saved it from capture. The caravan consisted of thousand camels and had taken goods worth 50,000 dinars, on which Abu Sufyan had made a cent per cent profit. Since every family of note in Mecca had invested in this caravan, its return with so much profit was a matter of jubilation for all Mecca, and it was spring in Arabia, the month of March 624. Even as the people of Mecca sang and danced and the merchants rubbed their hands while awaiting their share of the Prophet, the battered and broken army of Quraysh picked its weary way towards Mecca. This army had rushed out in response to Abu Sufyan's call for help when he had first realized the danger from the Muslims. Before the Quraysh army could come into action, however, Abu Sufyan had extricated the caravan and sent word to Quraysh to return to Mecca as the danger had passed. But Abu Jahl, who commanded the army, would have none of this. He had spent the past 15 years of his life in bitter opposition to the Prophet, and he was not going to let this opportunity slip away. Instead of returning, he had precipitated a battle with the Muslims. Now this proud army was returning home in a state of shock and humiliation. While the Quraysh army was still on its way, a messenger from it sped to Mecca on a fast camel. As he entered the outskirts of the town, he tore his shirt and wailed aloud, announcing tragedy. The people of Mecca hastily gathered around him to seek news of the battle. They would ask about their dear ones, and he would tell of their fate. Among those present, were Abu Sufyan and his wife, Hind. From this messenger, Hind heard the loss of her dear ones, of the death of her father, Utba, at the hands of Ali and Hamza, uncle of the Prophet, of the death of her uncle, Sheba, at the hands of Hamza, of the death of her brother, Walid, at the hands of Ali, of the death of her son, Handala, at the hands of Ali. She cursed Hamza and Ali and swore vengeance. The Battle of Badr was the first major clash between the Muslims and their enemies. A small force of 313 Muslims had stood like a rock against the onslaught of a thousand infidels. After an hour or two of severe fighting, the Muslims had shattered the Quraysh army and the Quraysh had fled in disorder from the battlefield. The finest of the Quraysh had fallen in battle or been taken prisoner. A total of 70 infidels had been killed and another 70 captured by the Muslims at the cost of only 14 Muslim dead. Among those killed were 17 members of the Bani Makhsum, most of them either cousins or nephews of Khalid. Abu Jahl had been killed, Khalid's brother Walid had been taken prisoner. As the messenger announced the names of those who had fallen and those who had killed them, the Quraysh noted the frequency with which the names of Ali and Hamza were repeated. Ali had killed 18 men by himself and had shared in the killings of four others. Hamza had killed four men and shared with Ali in the killing of another four. The name of Ali thus dominated the proceedings of this sad assembly. Two days later, Abu Sufyan held a conference of all the leaders of the Quraysh. There was not one amongst them who had not lost a dear one at Badr. Some had lost fathers, some sons, some brothers. 
the most vociferous at the conference was Sufwan bin Umayyah and Ikrima, son of Abu Jahl. Ikrima was the most difficult to restrain. His father had had the distinction of commanding the Quraysh army at Badr and had fallen in battle. The son drew some comfort from the fact that his father had killed a Muslim at Badr and that he himself had killed another. Moreover, he had attacked and severed the arm of the Muslim who had mortally wounded his father, but that was not enough to quench his thirst for revenge. He insisted that as noble Quraysh, they were honor bound to take revenge. And I have lost my son, Handala, said Abu Sufyan. My thirst for revenge is no less than yours. I shall be the first to prepare and launch a powerful expedition against Muhammad. At this conference, they all took the pledge of revenge. This time, none would stay back. An expedition would be prepared such as had never assembled at Mecca before, and other local tribes would be invited to join the expedition and take part in the annihilation of the Muslims. The entire profit from the caravans, amounting to 50,000 dinars, would be spent on financing the expedition. Abu Sufyan was unanimously elected as the commander of the Quraysh army. Abu Sufyan now gave two decisions, the first of which was more or less universally accepted. This was to the effect that there would be no weeping and no mourning of any kind for those who had fallen at Badr. The idea behind this order was that tears would wash away the bitterness in their hearts and that this bitterness should be kept alive until they had taken their revenge against the Muslims. However, those whose burden of sorrow was too heavy to carry wept secretly. The second decision related to the prisoners who were in Muslim hands. Abu Sufyan forbade all efforts to get them released for fear that if these efforts were made immediately, the Muslims might put up the price. This decision, however, was not followed by everyone. Within two days, a man left Mecca secretly at night to ransom his father. And when others came to know about this, they took the matter into their own hands and got their dear ones released. Abu Sufyan had no choice but to revoke his decision. The rate of ransom varied. The top rate was 4,000 dirhams and there was a graduated scale down to 1,000 dirhams for those who could not afford to pay more. A few prisoners who were too poor to pay but were literate earned their freedom by teaching a certain number of Muslim children to read and write. Some destitute ones were released by the Prophet without ransom on condition that they would never again take up arms against Muslims. Among those who went to negotiate the release of the prisoners were Ikrimah, Khalid, who had missed the Battle of Badr on account of his absence from the Hijaz, and Khalid's brother, Hisham. Khalid and Hisham arranged the release of their brother, Walid. When Hisham heard that the ransom would be 4,000 dirhams, he began to haggle for a lower sum, but was rebuked by Khalid. The sum of 4,000 dirhams was duly paid for the release of Walid, whereas the three brothers left Medina and camp for the night at a place called Zul Halifa, a few miles away. Here during the night, Walid slipped away from the camp, returned to Medina, reported to the Prophet and became a Muslim. He thereafter proved a devout Muslim and became very dear to the Prophet. And in spite of his new faith, his relations with Khalid remained as warm and loving as ever. While at the Quraysh conference, the main theme of the discussion had been revenge. Another factor which drove the Quraysh to war with the Muslims was economic survival. The main route of the Quraysh caravan to Syria and Palestine lay along the coastal road which now, after the Battle of Badr, was no longer open to them. In November, Sufwan bin Umayyah felt the need for more trade and dispatched a caravan towards Syria on another route which he thought might be safe. This caravan left Mecca on the road to Iraq and after traveling some distance turned northwest towards Syria by passing Medina at what Sufwan considered a safe distance. But the Holy Prophet came to know of this caravan and sent Zad bin Haritha with 100 men to capture it, which Zad did. Sufwan then went to Abu Sufyan and both leaders agreed that since the economic well-being 
and prosperity of the Quraysh depended on their profitable trade with Syria. The sooner the Muslims were crushed, the better. Iktima was also impatient and pressed for speed. Abu Sufyan, however, as a wild old chief, knew that it would take time to prepare the expedition and purchase the camels, the horses and the weapons. He promised to do his best. The preparations for the expedition now began in right earnest. While they were in progress, an unbeliever of doubtable character approached Abu Sufyan with a proposal. This man was Abu Amir of Medina. He had taken exception of the arrival of the Holy Prophet at Medina and to the speed with which members of his own clan, the Aus, had begun to embrace Islam. Consequently, he had left Medina and sworn never to return as long as Muhammad remained in power. At Mecca, he took to inciting the Quraysh against the Muslims. In the old days, Abu Amir had been known as the monk, but the Holy Prophet had given him the nickname of the Nave. Thus the Muslims knew this man as Abu Amir the Nave. I have fifty members of my clan with me, he said to Abu Sufyan. I have much influence with my clan, the Aus. I propose that before the battle begins, I be permitted to address the Aus among the Muslims, and I have no doubt that they will all desert Muhammad and come over to my side. Abu Sufyan gladly accepted the arrangement. The Aus were one of the two major tribes of Medina, and would comprise more than a third of the Muslim army. Parleys were begun with neighboring tribes, and strong contingents were received from the Kinana and the Thaqif. Early in March 625, the assembly of the expedition began at Mecca. At this time, Abbas, uncle of the Prophet, wrote to him from Mecca to inform him of the preparations being made against him. In the second week of March, the Quraysh set out from Mecca with an army of 3,000 men, of whom 700 were armored. They had 3,000 camels and 200 horses. With the army went 15 Quraysh women in litters, whose task it was to remind the Quraysh of the comrades who had fallen at Badr, and to strengthen their spirits. Among these women was Hind, who acted as their leader, and the role came naturally to her. Others were the wife of Ikrimah, the wife of Amr bin al-As and the sister of Khalid. One of the women, whom we shall hear of again later, was Amrah bint al qama and there were also some songstresses who carried tambourines and drums. As the expedition moved towards Medina, one of the leaders of the Quraysh, Jubair bin Mutim, spoke to his slave, who was known as the savage, Wahshi bin Harb. If you kill Hamza, the uncle of Muhammad, in revenge for the killing of my uncle at Badr, I shall free you. The savage liked the prospect. He was a huge black Abyssinian slave who always fought with a javelin from his native Africa. He was an expert with this weapon and had never been known to miss. After traveling a little further, the savage saw one of the litter carrying camels move up beside him. From the litter, Hint looked out and spoke to the savage. O father of blackness, she addressed him, heal and seek your reward. She promised him that if he would kill Hamza in revenge for his killing her father, she would give him all the ornaments that she was wearing. The savage looked greedily at her ornaments, her necklace, her bracelets, the rings that she wore on her fingers. They all looked very expensive and his eyes glittered at the prospect of acquiring them. The Holy Prophet had been warned by Abbas of the Quraysh preparations before they left Mecca. While they were on their way, he continued to receive information of their progress from friendly tribes. On March 20, the Quraysh arrived near Medina and camped a few miles away, in a wooded area west of Mount Uhud. On this very day, the Prophet sent two scouts to observe the Quraysh, and these scouts returned to give their exact strength. On March 21, the Prophet left Medina with 1,000 men, of whom 100 were armored. The Muslims had two horses, of which one was the Prophet's. They camped for the night near a small black hillock called Shaykhan, a little over a mile north of Medina. The following morning, before the march was resumed, the hypocrites, numbering 300 under the leadership of Abdullah bin Ubay, left the Prophet on the plea that fighting the Quraysh outside Medina had no prospect of success. 
and that they would not take part in an operation which in their view was doomed to failure. The hypocrites returned to Medina. The Prophet was now left with 700 men and with this strength he marched from the camp. The Prophet had not actually intended to fight outside Medina. It had been his wish that the Muslims should await the arrival of the Quraysh on their home ground and fight the battle in Medina. But most of the Muslims had insisted that they go out to meet the Quraysh and so the Prophet, submitting to their demand, had marched out to give battle to the Quraysh outside Medina. But although he was going out to meet his enemy in the open, he would nevertheless fight the battle on ground of his own choice. He moved to the foot of Mount Uhud and deployed for battle. Uhud.